innovation, trade and investment, connectivity and security aspect. Thank you all for accepting our invitation to participate in the seminar. Let me brief you about today's program. At the outset, Director General ICWA, Dr. TCA Raghavan will deliver welcome remarks, followed by opening remarks by Ambassador Nirpama Rao, former Foreign Secretary, Government of India. After the opening remarks, three technical sessions will be conducted as mentioned in the program. I request you all to kindly put your mobile phones on silent mode. May I now request DG ICWA to deliver his welcome remarks. Thank you. Good morning, Ambassador Nirupma Rao, ladies and gentlemen, dear, dear colleagues. Uh, it's a great uh, pleasure for me on behalf of my colleagues to welcome you all uh, here today for this two-day seminar on India and uh, uh, Sri Lanka. We are particularly grateful to so many of our outside participants who have taken the trouble to be with us for these uh, two days and are presenting papers, chairing uh, sessions. Uh, my colleagues and I, when we were thinking about the structure of this uh, uh, seminar, thought we should try to combine uh, the traditional focus of the ICWA on area studies with uh, two other uh, dimensions, which are also, of course, part of area studies, but nevertheless, in the India-Sri Lanka case, have a particular, particular uh, relevance and. Uh, so apart from uh, the bilateral political relationship, the uh, economic relationship and the wider external uh, dimensions of India-Sri Lanka relations, we thought we would also include a session on uh, the deeper historical and cultural contacts and uh, so as to both see their contemporary uh, relevance, but also marry it into uh, the rest of what we discuss in political, economic, and strategic uh, terms. So the first session, which uh, Ambassador Nupma Rao will uh, be chairing, apart from giving her opening address, will be about these deeper historical and cultural uh, civilizational links and their contemporary relevance. It is, of course, very difficult to, to always look for relevance in, histo in, in, in history. But nevertheless, I think that effort... Uh, uh, has to be made, especially when you're dealing with a neighboring country uh, interface. And I will leave it to Mrs. Rao's capable hands to see how to draw out that contemporary uh, relevance. The, the next two sessions, uh, uh, it's really one session but split into two, uh, looks at uh, India-Sri Lanka relations in the 1980s. And this is, of course, we are at the th threshold of uh, uh, the close of the final IPKF chapter, the, th the threshold of the uh, 30th uh, anniversary of that. And we are fortunate to have Ambassador Ronan Sen uh, chairing that uh, session. And I know he intends to, uh, apart from looking at the uh, participant, uh, looking at the IPKF experience through the eyes of the panelists in those two sub-sessions, but he also wishes to see it in a wider historical context because that is often forgotten. The late nine, mid and late 1980s was a critical time in Indian uh, foreign policy and strategic uh, thinking. This was the time of Glasnost and Perestroika. The Soviet Union was withdrawing from uh, Afghanistan. There was a sense of triumphalism uh, in uh, the Pakistan military in particular that the template developed, developed with regard to Afghanistan could then be applied against uh, India and Jammu and Kashmir. And it's no coincidence that in 1989, coinciding with the Soviet withdrawal from Afghanistan, you have the beginnings of the insurgency in Jammu and uh, uh, Kashmir. But there were other uh, wider changes taking place at that time. 1989 is the year of Tiananmen, uh, Tiananmen uh, Square. You have, uh, uh, you have the end of the Cold War looming. The Berlin Wall uh, is coming down. Uh, and so on and so forth. So I think that wider historical perspective when we look at uh, our own IPKF experience uh, is something which will be uh, very um, uh, valuable. Uh, the final session uh, today is about the economic and commercial uh, 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 relationship. 
uh, and uh, uh, and also looking tomorrow and tomorrow we will be looking at in the at the india sri lanka interface in a uh, broader context in terms of the maritime domain regional security uh, issues and finally how sri lanka's external relations uh, impinge on uh, india sri lanka relations uh, too uh, uh, I'm very grateful to Ambassador Nirupma Rao for agreeing to deliver the opening address and also chair uh, the first session. I'm also very grateful to all the chairs of the different uh, sessions and of course to the uh, participants. We are, uh, uh, we are fortunate to have Ambassador Ranjan Mithai, Ambassador T.P. Srinivasan uh, and of course the many, many others who will be uh, joining us who are already here to steer us through this uh, two-day conference and may I uh, finally conclude by thanking all of you again for your presence here today. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, I would now invite Mrs. Uh, Nirubha Rao to deliver her opening uh, remarks. She of course needs no introduction. She's the former High Commissioner to uh, Sri Lanka, she has been the Foreign Secretary of India, she has uh, been Ambassador to the United States, Ambassador to uh, China. Uh, Post-retirement, she has numerous other attributes including setting up a, a, a full uh, orchestra. But So thank you very much ma'am for your presence here today. Thank you, Ambassador Raghavan, and High Commissioner Austin Fernando, Ambassadors Matai and T.P. Srinivasan, and I see a lot of familiar faces in the audience here today. Uh, good morning and my warm greetings to all of you. I'm back here at the ICWA exactly after eight years, I think. I remember just before I gave over charge as Foreign Secretary, we had a little function here and I recall uh, coming here at that time. It's wonderful to be back. Sri Lanka has been, um, oh, uh, let me say, I have been closely associated with Sri Lanka uh, since um, the early 80s when I went there on my first posting as a very junior diplomat, uh, as a baby diplomat, as they would say. Um, much before the Civil War started. And um, like Ambassador Matai here, I, we, he and I did the same jobs in the High Commission. Uh, I was called the First Secretary Passport and Agreement. And it's not a very glamorous title, but uh, I must say that that was one of the assignments that I enjoyed most in my diplomatic career. Because um, you dealt with people who are at the heart of any diplomatic assignment. One has to keep that in mind. And these were people uh, who were tea estate laborers, very different from the so-called constituency that diplomats normally deal with. And uh, that enabled me to discover a lot of Sri Lanka, especially the Central Highlands, and the northern part of the country, the northwestern part of the country, uh, because repatriation involved a lot of these laborers going back uh, to Tamil Nadu, uh, from which their forefathers had come, but with which they had hardly any contact. So there was that human humanitarian dimension to the work you did also. So the theme uh, of this conference, which I think is extremely timely and relevant, is India-Sri Lanka relations in the present context and is it time for reorientation of policy. I reflected uh, a little, for a little while on this title while I was putting together my thoughts on what I should speak about. And uh, the first thought that came to mind was that policy by definition cannot be a static commodity. It evolves. It is affected by time, by personalities, by circumstances, whether they are geopolitical, economic, climate today, terrorism, the list could go on. With Sri Lanka, 
a country for which India is really the only neighbor in the physical, geographical sense, our relationship has had a construct defined both by ethnic, cultural, and religious factors, as also by its crucial nearness as seen in the dynamic of domestic politics within India and by the nation's significant role, I mean Sri Lanka's significant role, in the emerging contours of what is fashionably called today the Indo-Pacific. So change is a constant as I see it in our relations with Sri Lanka. But the past is another country, as they say. When I first went to Sri Lanka in the autumn of 1981, a single air route connected India with Sri Lanka between Chennai and Colombo. It was still called Madras in those days. Plus, there was a steamboat, originally the Scottish ship, the Irwin, renamed the TSS Ramanujam, which plied between Talai Mannar on the northwestern coast of Sri Lanka and Rameshwaram in Tamil Nadu. The ship sailing across the Pork Strait took around three hours each way, and it was crowded on the sailing to India with stateless hill country Tamils of Indian origin from the TS states of Sri Lanka who were being repatriated to India, most unfairly and callously in my view, under the terms of the Sirimavo Shastri Pact of 1964. Sri Lanka in those days had a huge issue with these hapless laborers, all Sri Lanka born, second and third generation descendants of workers hired from the districts of southern Tamil Nadu, who were stateless persons with no voice, and a proportion of whom India had reluctantly agreed to take back, while the rest were given Sri Lankan citizenship. To a junior diplomat from India, Sri Lanka in those pre-Civil War days seemed the safest place to be in, although one had heard about the ethnic riots that would occasionally erupt and were directed against the Tamil minority, particularly the laborers I just referred to. I could drive my own personal car unaccompanied by anyone from Colombo to Kandy, Nuralia, Hatton, Badulla, and even to Talai Manar. It just seemed the normal thing to do. I was dealing with repatriation of these estate people, and they were literally my parish. I interacted with them and those who were involved in the trade unions covering the TS states, people like Mr. Aziz of the Democratic Workers' Congress, the legendary Mr. Thondaman, and the wonderful poet of the men and women of the tea country, Mr. C. V. Velu Pillay. In July 1983, all that changed with the horrendous wave upon wave of rioting, looting, and burning that gripped Colombo and Kandy and other towns in the central part and southern part of the country particularly. I was introduced to the life of the refugee camp and the thousands of homeless people, many of them with just the clothing on them and with no belongings left, their homes having been looted and burned by mobs from the majority community of Sinhalese Buddhists seeking to avenge the death of a group of 13 army men in the northern province by the LTTE. And that really was a watershed moment, a defining moment in many ways. I saw overnight how our approach to the whole minority question in Sri Lanka had been transformed. Most of the concentration of our attention prior to those ethnic riots had been on the tea estate sector, the people of Indian origin, questions of statelessness, uh, humanitarian issues, and suddenly the whole concentration, as it were, was focused on the Tamil question, on the issue of minorities in Sri Lanka. What was happening in Jaffna? Why were the uh, why was the issue of uh, uh, separation, if I'm, one can call it, uh, so prominent and so uh, salient to the narrative concerning the minorities in the country. And uh, 
Overnight, we had a visit by Mr. G. Parthasarathy, GP as he was called, as an envoy of Mrs. Indira Gandhi, the Prime Minister, to talk to the Sri Lankan government about these issues and to see how uh, the minority question could be better addressed, more fairly addressed, and more justice and equity be delivered to the minority. So in many ways, we adopted the cause, as it were, uh, almost overnight, or so it seemed, uh, on the surface at least. The inflow of refugees into Tamil Nadu was growing. We had migrant refugee camps set up, the whole issue of how these people were to be rehabilitated. I understand that even today there are about 60,000 of such refugees in Tamil Nadu who we have to see what happens to them. And I won't go into what happened in those intervening years. I was not in Sri Lanka. In any case, I had gone on to do work on China but uh, was definitely following events there. Uh, we had, of course, uh, various missions from the country to deal with constitutional issues that would, could deliver, uh, as I said, more justice to the minorities, provide for devolution, still a very live issue in the country. Of course, the ill-fated India-Sri Lanka agreement and the IPKF, the arrival of the IPKF uh, and the 30th anniversary, as Ambassador Raghavan said, is to be shortly marked. We now have an IPKF memorial near the parliament in Colombo. And uh, we still remember the many lives of officers and men of the Indian Army that were lost there. I think we haven't paid sufficient attention as a country, I think, to the sacrifices that those men made, men in uniform made, for the unity and territorial integrity of Sri Lanka. Of course, uh, tragedy upon tragedy, we had a uh, a former prime minister assassinated uh, as a kind of denouement really to that sequence of events and a full-blown civil war in the country. So therefore from an inchoate toleration of the Tamil fight for rights but without ever supporting I must add the vivisection of Sri Lanka we went on to becoming opponents of the LTT and Tamil militancy, especially after the murder of Rajiv Gandhi. The withdrawal of the IPKF because of domestic political pressures within Tamil Nadu spelt a mission unaccomplished because the war continued and our role receded from the forefront into some sort of strategic, shadowy, Trishanku world where neither side had much trust in our capacity to deliver the outcomes that they desired. I mean, neither side in the civil war. Our visible presence across the island was seen again in the aftermath of the Indian Ocean tsunami of December 2004, more than a decade after the IPKF withdrawal. I still remember a telephone call that I uh, received. I was in Bangalore on a brief vac vacation, it was Christmas time, from the then Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa. And nobody knew really what had happened. And I remember the words on that phone call that uh, he tells me, we've had a sea attack. Those are the exact words he used. We've had a sea attack. And I assume that that had something to do with, you know, uh, an LTT, uh, you know, event, some kind of, uh, you know, attack that had been launched. We later, of course, knew what it was. But this was more than a decade after the IPKF withdrawal that our visible presence, presence of our, especially our armed forces was being in Sri Lanka. They were there on a mission of mercy. A tragedy this time of a natural disaster redeemed us by allowing us to perform a role of first responders for Sri Lanka in a time of great distress. And we proved our capacity to deliver support and sustenance many times over all across the island, even in the LTT areas. I remember going into Jaffna and Point Pedro and, of course, Rampare, Baticolo, Trincomalee, areas that our diplomats had not gone to uh, for some years and uh, in order to deliver aid. And seeing in the refugee camps many, many members of the LTT with black bands around their arms moving around and obviously communicating, it was a quite a you know, surreal experience. Uh, it was India's largest relief operation outside her shores in our independent history, and it was both impactful and effective. 
In the years following, while I was still in Sri Lanka as High Commissioner, one saw the first signs of the emergence of a China factor in terms of actual physical presence in project assistance, in uh, raising their profile uh, with the news that uh, the, pre the government of President Chandrika Kumaratunga had decided to award the construction of a coal-powered power plant in Norochulai, which is in the Nigambo area north of uh, Colombo, uh, to, uh, to the Chinese. And uh, I remember the fo then Foreign Minister of Sri Lanka, Lakshman Kadirgamar, telling us at this time, when all this was happening with the Chinese uh, rearing their heads, as it were, uh, our um, Foreign Minister, then Foreign Minister, Mr. Natwar Singh, was visiting the country. And I remember this meeting in Mr. Kadirgamar's office where uh, not sorry, not Mr. Natwar Singh, our then Chief of Naval Staff, Admiral Arun Prakash, was visiting. And uh, he tells the Admiral, uh, they were referring to, you know, the tsunami, post-tsunami situation, and then uh, the political developments in Sri Lanka, and uh, relations between India and Sri Lanka, which uh, Mr. Kadirgamar was uh, often wont to describe as in a state of irreducible excellence, as he called it. Uh, we still have a long way, I think, to go on that. But he, re referring to Trincomalee on the east coast of uh, Sri Lanka, that jewel of a harbor, saying, uh, and these were his exact words, take Trincomalee, it is too big for Sri Lanka, I remember him telling it, telling us, telling uh, the admiral. Of course, Mr. Kadirgamar unfortunately lost his life uh, a few uh, months later in the aug August 11th, I think it was, 2005. I was. I happened to be the last foreigner to have met him uh, the evening uh, of his assassination. There was a little function at the Bandaranaike Institute of International Studies in Colombo, where he released uh, the first issue of a journal of the institute and uh, wanted to hand it, give it to us. Actually, it was for Mr. I.K. Gujral, who couldn't make the trip. And I sort of stood in for Mr. Gujral at that uh, event. And I remember uh, meeting Mr. Kadir Gamar for the last time. It was just a couple of hours later that we heard about his assassination in the swimming pool of his new, resi of his new residence uh, from, uh, from uh, shots fired out of a neighbor's window overlooking the pool. One can't imagine how a man with that kind of degree of security could have been exposed in that fashion. But I think his death also uh, was a watershed uh, for Sri Lanka. I think he was a man who understood also uh, the importance of relations with Sri Lanka. Uh, there were, of course, uh, divided opinions sometimes about his attitude uh, towards uh, questions concerning India and Pakistan, for instance. But overall, I think he understood the dynamic of what a united South Asia uh, should be. And his favorite uh, definition of South Asia as an integer I'm very fond of quoting uh, when I talk of the need for a more concentration on our part, particularly as the biggest country in the region, uh, to define a concept uh, of South Asia. But in any case, um, this was at a time when presidential elections had, were being, uh, had been announced, and you saw the emergence of the candidature of Mahinda Rajapaksa and his dramatic victory against uh, the opposing candidate, uh, now the Prime Minister of Sri Lanka, Ranil Vikramasinghe, who was, who was incidentally the favorite, tipped to be the favorite to win. But uh, Mr. Rajapaksa emerged as the victor, and I think, it, if I may say so, I think one has to look also at the whole scale boycott of the election in the north and the east by, of the country by orders to the Tamil population from the LTT, which was, which was I think, a significant factor determining the outcome of uh, the election. Mr. Rajap, uh, I'm happy to say that the High Commission did forecast the result of the election <laughs> correctly. <laughs> we believe Mr. Rajapaksa uh, would win. Um, Mr. Rajapaksa, as I came to know him, uh, is a very talented people's politician, not anglicized at all, like many, uh, many uh, politicians uh, that we've seen from Sri Lanka leaders. Uh, speaking the tongue of the masses, especially the rural voter, and from the heartland of the south, 
And in his presidency, he became this towering, dominating, outmaneuvering figure. And of course, his family fortunes rose formidably with that rise, and his brothers Gotabaya and Basil by his side. Sri Lanka had changed, I think, during those years, and I was privy to that. And the Indian leadership, who had no previous dealing really with the family and with Mr. Rajapaksa himself, had to adjust to this new reality, although uh, we did that uh, slowly, and, uh, but it took time. He ran his own policy, uh, Mr. Rajapaksa, both domestically and on the neighborhood front. He clearly enjoyed playing the Pakistan and China cards, cards testing Indian metal constantly. Hambantota, which was his neck of the woods, he wanted to develop as a port. And I can say that uh, I, I presume that Chatham House rules would apply here to some not, extent. No? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> OK. Anyway, I'll try to put it as elliptically as I can. Um, he, uh, I must say that the, and I think this is common knowledge, that the development of the Hambantota port was offered to India first. But we looked at it only from the economic vantage point of view and not the strategic angle. The investment was viewed as non-viable. I think we took more of the financial perspective on this. But certainly, the offer was made uh, by Mr. Rajapaksa himself to us. Uh, we were content with the leasing of some of the World War II oil tanks at Trincomalee, the entry of Indian oil into the Sri Lankan market, the Apollo hospitals. I think we perhaps did not make the calculations about a Chinese giant beginning to stir in the region. And Pakistani intelligence was also making deeper inroads into Sri Lankan territory. The High Commissioner of Pakistan himself was a retired intelligence bureau, not ISI, official of the most aggressive and hostile anti-India variety. And uh, Mr. Rajapaksa, if I may say, enjoyed the fireworks and the provocation provided uh, to India. The Chinese had begun to translate their plans for registering their presence across the Indian Ocean space, and the Hambantota port went ahead. Meanwhile, the ceasefire in the Civil War was fraying at the edges and finally collapsed by 2006 with the murders, assassinations, suicide bombings, and finally, open conflict resuming. At this time, the Sri Lankans were very keen on a defense agreement with India, which would guarantee India as the first security partner. And the, but the idea did not leave the drawing board, because we obviously did not want to be drawn into such an arrangement at the time, given the sensitivities associated with the Tamil factor in the Civil War and our own domestic political constraints. There is a lot of assumption about our help being critical to the Sri Lankans winning the war against the LTT. There is more than an element of exaggeration in this assumption, is all I can say. We steered clear of any active help. No offensive military assistance was ever provided. But it can be said that we were not on the side of the LTT at all. And that made a big difference for the government in Colombo. We did not want secession or separatism for the country. We were firmly against terrorism. But we were sensitive also to the welfare of the Tamil minority and affording them some relief with small project assistance, especially post-tsunami, and maintaining communication with Tamil civil society, particularly in health, housing, and education. When the war ended in May 2009, the north and east of the country was a ravaged area, scarred by war, death, and the erosion of a society as it had existed prior to the war. Our emphasis was on relief, rehabilitation, and as far as we could push it, reconciliation. In the last, I can say, progress was questionable, to say the very least. The unaccounted people who had disappeared were missing, were dead, the human rights violations that had clearly occurred, camouflaged by the fog of war, were disturbing reminders of the fact that though the war was over, the battle for Tamil hearts and minds, if there ever was one, had been lost. 
We established a consulate general in Jaffna and one in Hambantota immediately after the war ended. These were good moves and an example of quick, dexterous diplomacy that saw the need for a presence of both at both these crucial locations. In Jaffna especially, the alienation of the local population vis-a-vis -vis India needed to be addressed. There was, they were convinced, particularly the intelligentsia in the university circles and educational institutions and among doctors and media outlets, that India had betrayed the Tamil cause during the war and abandoned the people of the North and the East. I'm not sure if that feeling has receded in any significant measure. It is not an easy relationship that we have with the indigenous Tamil population of Sri Lanka and even those of Indian origin, I would say today. Our relations with them were victims of the landscape of war. The ouster of the Rajapaksas in 2015 seemed to signal a new chapter in Sri Lankan politics, but the political infighting between the Sirisena and Vikramasinghe factions of the government has been deleterious for Sri Lanka. The Chinese factor has also not receded, although it seemed for some time at the inception of the new government after 2015 that things would change and there would be a pushback against overwhelming Chinese inroads into the country. The 99-year lease on Hambantota for China is replete with all kinds of possibilities involving much more than a mere business and economic Chinese presence in the years to come. The, Clum the Colombo Port City project is another game changer for China. The Chinese presence in Sri Lanka, and I make quite frequent trips there, is stark and visible across the board. What are the lessons to be learned? One point is very clear. Our concern and our interest in Sri Lanka is completely legitimate because it affects our well-being and security. India and Sri Lanka deserve a much closer, more well-integrated relationship in all spheres, be it security and defense, political, developmental, and people-to-people. -people. The trust quotient, which is at a low-level equilibrium, has to be enhanced. Connectivity, especially from the Indian side to Sri Lanka, must improve. We have to convey that we are not competing with China for Sri Lanka, but that we have a solid, sustainable rationale to have ex excellent relations with each other for our mutual well-being as two sister democracies with similar systems of functioning. This has to be a wavelength of understanding we establish with successive governments including with the Rajapaksas if they are voted back into power in the next elections. With the Tamil political parties, we must build more trust, much more trust, and not be hesitant to speak to the powers that be in Colombo. That a strong center need not mean a lack of devolution of power in governance to the minority inhabited regions of the country. The concept of a free and open Indo-Pacific is mentioned frequently by the Sri Lankans and that tallies well with our own vision. Codes of conduct, freedom of navigation and building a security architecture for the Indian Ocean as we speak of a security architecture for the South China Sea, uh, other regions of the Asia Pacific, should involve the Sri Lankans as much as our other Southeast Asian partners. Sri Lanka is a close partner of ours in BIMSTEC, even as the SARC, as a project of regional cooperation, has run aground, and economic diplomacy has to be infused with much more strategic reassurance provided to the Sri Lankans that they are not going to be put at a disadvantage by such cooperation with India, which has proved to be an obstacle so far in taking forward economic trade and technical cooperation. Fisheries matters between our two countries have experienced constant difficulty. Our own fishermen and the political interests tied to them in southern Tamil Nadu have their interests, have, have concerns that do not coincide with those of the fishing communities on the Sri Lankan side, especially in the Jaffna Peninsula and in Mannar, both Tamic, Tamil ethnically, but diametrically opposed to what the other side wants. A modus vivendi that safeguards livelihoods on both sides and the protection, I would emphasize, 
of the fragile marine environment is a necessity that governments on either side can ill afford to ignore. The ties between Indians and Sri Lankans endure through all this. This is a natural symbiotic compact nourished by shared cultural tradition, religious belief, linguistic origin, ethnicity, and a natural affinity that endures despite political suspicion, the low trust quotient, and the big versus small syndrome that is always a complicating factor. Peninsular India, especially the four southern states, are a natural catchment area for the development of closer, more sound India-Sri Lanka relations, just as much as the nearness of India should facilitate both sides on the ethnic divide within Sri Lanka to seal a closer integration of interests and development and governance goals with each other that can in turn build a solid, mutually beneficial relations, relationship with Sri Lanka's only neighbor, India. The Easter Sunday bombings of April this year and the devastation they wrought in the country, which had assumed that they had overcome terrorism once for all, has shaken Sri Lanka and the aftershocks have still not receded completely. The economy, particularly the tourism industry, has greatly suffered and its impact on people and their livelihoods is still unfolding. If there's one lesson to be learned from the tragedy, it is that there is scope for far greater and closer cooperation between India and Sri Lanka to prevent the reoccurrence of such tragedies through better security and intelligence coordination and alignment against such destructive forces. Pluralistic, diverse sets of communities and religious groups inhabit both countries, which entails that both nations have to resist the scourge of religious extremism and radicalism unremittingly. At the same time, all communities that constitute the fabric of our societies have to be included in the goals of building national strength and prosperity. The atrocities committed by a few should not become a trigger for exclusionary tendencies exercised against minorities in either society, because the lessons of the past as in the roots of Sri Lanka's civil war, are important cautionary pointers for the future. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for uh, insightful uh, opening remarks. We will straight away begin the first session. Uh, I request all the panelists to uh, take seat on the dais, please. The first session, India-Sri Lanka Contemporary Dimensions of Historical and Civilizational Linkages, will be chaired by Ambassador Nirpama Rao. Ma'am, I request you to give your remarks and introduce the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Samata. So session one concerns India-Sri Lanka contemporary dimensions of historical and civilizational linkages. I have just inflicted my opening address on you, so I uh, don't want to take too much time introducing this topic. Uh, but to say that I'm always uh, reminded of uh, Gandhiji's, uh, you know, very very famous aphorism in many ways when he made one of his trips to Sri Lanka, that Sri Lanka is a pearl uh, which has dropped off the nose ring of India. And uh, so it's certainly the pearl of the Indian Ocean in many ways. Uh, and uh, it expresses what that ocean means to all of us. Uh, you just have to visit the island and uh, you know, see the, the splendor and the strength of that ocean that defines our existence in, in so many ways. Uh, so the historical and civilizational linkages, I mean, it's a tautology, I think, to be talking about it. It exists, it, you know, it moves us, it defines what we are, Indians and Sri Lankans. Uh, 
uh, in terms of the flora and fauna uh, that we share, in terms of the history and the mythologies that, we, that, uh, that link us together, and, uh, and the, the flow of uh, people and ideas and concepts between the two nations that has existed from time Im immemorial. So in terms of the history, I was at the, um, I think it was at the Salaja Museum in Hyderabad the other day, and they had this beautiful miniature painting by Abhanindranath Tagore of uh, Prince Mahinda and Princess Sangamitra uh, bringing uh, the Bodhi tree to Sri Lanka. And I, it expressed the whole uh, you know, concept of the linkage between our two countries. That Bodhi tree that you see today in Anuradhapura and uh, which a sapling from which was used, taken back to Bodh Gaya to revive our own original Bodhi tree. So you see this cross fertilization that has taken place uh, between India and Sri Lanka. You know, our linguistic roots, the many migrations. Uh, the wife of um, uh, the late uh, Ambassador and High Commissioner Thomas Abraham, Mrs. Mira Abraham, who was a very distinguished historian in her own right, would talk of this historical linkage and the way it has happened constantly in terms of migrations between the two countries. A lot of Sinhalese will tell you about their origins in Orissa and Bengal. But I think that uh, connection uh, with Peninsula India and the two communities that inhabit uh, the nation, uh, the Sinhalese and the Tamils, has been a constant one. Uh, I think our genealogies are shared. Uh, in many ways, we are 100% South Asian, and it doesn't matter where we come from. And I'm saying this because it actually happened to me. Uh, you know, in the United States, you can get your DNA checked, and you can send a DNA sample uh, to the laboratory. And I did that, thinking, you know, it would come back with a whole chronicle of and the narratives of where I belong and where I come from. Just a one sentence verdict delivered at the end of the test which said 100% South Asian. <laughs> that was, so that's what we are in, in many ways, I think. Uh, and that uh, really, I think, is what we must keep in mind despite all the tensions and the differences and the suspicions and the, as I said, the big versus small syndrome that sometimes seems to occupy the space of the relationship uh, in, every, in everything in everything we do. And I found it itself that the awareness of India is very great in Sri Lanka, much greater than it used to be in the early 80s when I first served there, where I think communications were not as closely uh, intertwined and developed as they are today. And uh, I, I, I mean, I think the integration, I don't, wouldn't call it an integration process, but this kind of symbiosis, I would, uh, say that exists between the two countries, and Mr. Satyamurti constantly uh, is a you know I read what you write with great interest always, and you're in a much better position to speak about these civilizational linkages. And I always remember what Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe once told me that Anuradhapura is essentially Magad transposed 2,000 miles away uh, to an island in the Indian Ocean. It speaks of the uh, civilizational space that, that we share from Kandahar in Afghanistan to the little village of Gandhara in near Mathara in southern Sri Lanka. That is really the civilizational space that we must celebrate and I hope we will speak of. So I'd like to invite, who will, who will come first? Uh, it is so, Dr. Jen. Vadram Karane Vishrunayam Devaha Vadram Pasema Vajrajatraha Stirai Rangai Stushtubang Sastanu Vir Vishamai Devahitam Yadayuhu Respected Chairperson of this session, learned scholars on the dash, of the dash. It is our uh, privilege to share uh, our knowledge and uh, learn from the scholarly persons on this uh, occasion of uh, this today's uh, 
National Seminar organized by Indian Council of World Affairs. First, we uh, thank. Uh, as uh, we know, the theme of the seminar is uh, related with uh, India and uh, Sri Lanka relations in contemporary age. Uh, I have determined my topic from the uh, literary and language and art point of view. So my topic is uh, Buddhism linkages between India and Sri Lanka in the light of language, literature and art. If we have some query, if uh, we have uh, some discussion in our mind, we must see to do our literature and uh, what happened, what has happened in the past. Because uh, literature is the reflection of uh, our uh, culture and society. Let us uh, see how our uh, uh, India literature is very rich. If uh, I could a sloka or stanza from our literature that is in Upanishadic stanza, that is, Ayam nijaha parabeti Ganana laguchi tasam udara charita nam tu basudheva kutumbakam. Just uh, Madam was quoting how Rabina Tagore and others from Santi Niketan and Mahendra Sangavintra and they sent the thing. The history we know all. But uh, some special points uh, which uh, I would like to focus uh, from uh, uh, literary literature. Uh, language, literature, and art. How the language uh, that uh, we can say Indian language uh, uh, mainly concerned with Sanskrit literature and that is also Vedic literature. So that uh, leading to the Sanskrit and Pali and Prakrit language. So uh, on that basis the language is concerned and the literature whatever the Buddhism and Indian literature, the Pali and Prakrit, there is also link, much relation. And when the society develops and civilizations, and on the basis of uh, uh, this uh, civilization, our uh, thought, our culture, so I would like to uh, focus some points because it, it is very difficult to uh, read out all the uh, things within a stipulated time. Numerous uh, speculations have been uh, put, over, um, put forth by various scholars, thinkers, spiritual leaders, social reformers, Indologists, historians, archaeologists, geolists, geologists, etc. Both of the East and the West on Buddhism linkages between India and Sri Lanka from various purpose, uh, perspectives such as sociocultural, linguistic, literary, art, historical, archaeological, geograph geographical, etc. so and so, so forth. So for the theme of uh, the present uh, paper is concerned, we have dis uh, confined our study within Buddhism linkages between India and Sri Lanka in the light of language and literature which shall be analyzed. Uh, the uh, uh, society lead to both uh, the Sri Lanka and India reflecting their re religious ideas and thoughts. The lifestyle and culture of India is much similar with Sri Lanka. It is very apparent that there is close relationships among people of India and Sri Lanka. Literature is the reflection of our culture and society. We have three major languages, that is Sanskrit, Pali and Prakrit, leading Indian literature so far, Hinduism, Buddhism and Jainism are concerned. The Vedic literature or Sanskrit literature is replete with the values of discipline, conservation, peace, harmony, and non-violence, which have direct bearings upon modern thoughts of civilization. In the same sequences, we also come across the Pali and uh, Prakrit languages lead to Buddhist and Jain literatures, which speak much about the same ideas, thoughts, and behavior of people in the society. It is well known that uh, Buddhism is a religion that was founded by Gautam Buddha 
more than 2005 year, years ago in India, the follow, followers and scholars consider Buddhism is one of the major religions of the world. Being a closest neighbor of India, the relationship between the two countries have built up a legacy of intellectual, cultural, religious, and linguistic intercourse. Relations between the two countries have also matured and diversified with the passage of time encompassing all areas of of contemporary uh, relevance. In recent area, years, the relationship has been marked by close contacts at the highest political level, growing trade and investment, cooperation in the fields of development, education, culture, and defense, as well as a broad understanding on major issues of international interest. Today, the India-Sri Lanka relationship is strong and posed for a quantum jump by building on the rich legacy of historical linkages and uh, strong economic and development partner partnerships that have been forged. Cultural cooperation is a very important aspect of the um, bilateral relationship and the cultural cooperation agree, um, agreement signed by the government of India and the government of Sri Lanka on 29th November 1977. Uh, uh, at New Delhi. It forms the basis on which the uh, periodic cultural exchange programs between the two countries are signed and implemented. The program of cultural uh, corporation co cooperation PCC for 2010-13 seeks to enhance the level of cooperation in a wide variety of fields such as uh, performing arts, visual arts, libraries, museums, uh, archives, and uh, cultural documentation, archaeology, handicrafts, sports, and youth affairs, publications and professional exchanges, and mass media. The Indian Cultural Center in Col Colombo actively promotes awareness of uh, Indian cul culture by offering classes in Indian music, dance, Hindi, and Yugo. Every year, cultural troops from both countries exchange visits. India is also committed to the restoration of important icons of cultural heritage of Sri Lanka and is setting up an Indian gallery at the uh, International Buddhist Museum in Kandy and working on the restoration of the uh, Tiruke Theswaram temple in Manar. India and Sri Lanka also commemorated the uh, 2600 uh, year of the attainment of enlightenment by Lord Buddha. Hmm? Uh, Samuthatva Jayanti, through joint activities in the, uh, in the same manner, many activities have been organized by both of uh, countries to strengthen the relationship between two countries. Uh, let me uh, make uh, uh, precise how uh, the main factors of uh, the language and literature art is uh, uh, making uh, the relationship between two countries. There are three, uh, there are, uh, uh, three terms which we need to consider are Sanskrit and Pali and Prakrit. Uh, we will also need to consider the terms uh, Magadhi and Ardha Magadhi. What does Sanskrit mean? It has a root meaning which does not actually refer to a language as such, but uh, to the concept of something being refined or purified. The term Sanskrit can be found in Buddhi Buddhist texts used in the sense of meaning that uh, which is refined as opposed to that which is natural, mm, which is, that is called Prakrit. Likewise, in Sankhya, which is considered as the text uh, based on six systems of Indian philosophy, where we find principle of uh, uh, prakriti, uh, that nature. Hence, prakrit is that which is natural. So, in a sense, then, Sanskrit doesn't refer to a language as such, but to that which is refined or uh, purified speech. The languages in which the Vedas are written are not quite the same as classical 
uh, Sanskrit which are standardized by Panini in about 2nd century hmm, BCE. Despite the variations in the linguistic forms, uh, forms uh, from the Rug Veda, which is uh, considerably, considerably different from class, classical Sanskrit. The languages of the majority of Indian high cultural texts are all in forms of Sanskrit. Some of the later texts such as Puranas and the epics are often not in very refined Sanskrit, but they are still in Sanskrit. Also from um, around the 2nd century BCE onwards, Buddhist texts uh, begin to be produced in Sanskrit. Now, these texts are often in a kind of Sanskrit mixed with vernacular forms and which is often uh, referred to a Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit. They are hybrid as they are mix of Sanskrit and Prakrit. So we should bear in mind that the term Sanskrit doesn't simply refer to the classical standard form of the language, but rather to a group of uh, related language forms uh, which say are a common uh, heritage in grammar, vocabulary, and syntax. The situation at the time of Buddha was probably very similar with a wide variety of languages being spoken in the area in which he lived. The mm, dominant Prakrit language of his period in the area mm, where he was active uh, was called Magadhi, as is the present Hindi dialect of the area. This uh, name is also preserved in the name given to Prakrit of uh, many of the Jain scripts. Mm, there are uh, compiled from oral, uh, from oral sources based on traditions active mainly in the mm, Magad area and the language of these scriptures is called Ardha Magadhi. That is half Magadhi. It is a form of cleaned up Magadhi. Half was uh, mm, half way between uh, every everyday speech and pure language. The most important uh, reason to consider any of uh, this is that we need to consider how the Buddha would have addressed his audiences. He would have uh, needed to speak in, in such a manner as would have been comprehensible to his audience. Clearly is a situation of uh, such linguistic diversity he would have uh, had to um, modulate his forms of speech according to the uh, audience he was addressing, speaking to a king uh, and to a group of street children. <coughs> we, uh, we need to speak uh, in different ways. To make more precise, let us uh, see how the Buddhist literature through the Pali literature language he relates with Indian literature through Sanskrit language and literature. Sanskrit is a classical language which uh, flourished in India thousands year, uh, of years ago but has lost its glory in modern times. Pali is also an ancient language that has widely used in the Buddhist scriptures. The Sanskrit language is much older than Pali. Sanskrit had a language that was in Bhagu from the Vedic period. Sanskrit had a great influence on religion and literature. Sanskrit was part of the cultural tradition. Sanskrit which is considered uh, an um, old Indo-Aryan language was a uh, liturgical language of Jainism, Hinduism and Buddhism. Niranjan, I am so sorry to interrupt. You have exactly one uh, minute more. Okay, in this way, there are many texts which is written in uh, Sanskrit right from Veda. The scholars have written in same manner, like uh, uh, Aswaghusa, the very uh, famous writer, uh, 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 follower of Buddhism, he has written many texts and uh, quoting from the text. And uh, uh, that uh, another two scholars from Sri Lanka, they are uh, Buddha Ghosa and uh, Buddha Dutta. They have also written their text in Pali, but uh, quoting from that uh, uh, Sanskrit literature. In uh, uh, Buddhi Buddhist literature, there, are, uh, there is some uh, uh, text like uh, uh, Tripitaka, 
बिनय पीठक सूत्र पीठक अभिधर्म पीठक पीठक दैट इज ऑल्सो फाउंड इन द संस्कृत लिटरेचर लाइक सूत्र पीरियड धर्मशास्त्र गुरुए सूत्र अल्सो इन दिस वे देर आर मच सिमिलरिटी लिंकेज एंड सिंस वी एज वी ऑल नो द बुद्ध द ओरिजिनेटेड एंड फाउंडेड फ्रॉम द इंडिया एंड आफ्टर देन इन द कोर्स ऑफ टाइम इट वाज स्प्रेड इन आवर नेबर नेबर कंट्री सो आई थिंक देयर इज मच सिमिलरिटी एंड लिंक विथ डेस्पाइट द वेराइटी ऑफ दैट लैंग्वेज लिटरेचर एंड कल्चर एंड वी कैन से जे यूनिटी इन डाइवर्सिटी सो देर आर मेनी थिंग्स एविडेंसेस इट इज वेरी डिफिकल्ट थैंक यू वी कंटिन्यू इन द डिस्कशन आई थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर योर पेशन थैंक यू थैंक यू May I now invite Dr. Manoharan to speak on white man's burden, colonial impact on inter-ethnic relations in Sri Lanka and India-Sri Lanka relations. He is associate professor at the Christ University in Bengaluru. Yeah. Respected chairperson, fellow panelists, and distinguished audience, very good morning louder. to you all. At the outset, I must uh, appreciate uh, ICWA uh, for. organizing this it's a timely and wonderful uh, uh, conference that uh, you have thought about uh, especially the reorientation is 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 what uh, we need to look at uh, i have been tasked to look at the the historical aspect ambassador nirupama rao uh, you all agree that uh, she has beautifully traced the chronology since independence uh, till date so my task is to go to look at the roots of it she traced the uh, the the branches and leaves and uh, all those things so i need to go into deep in two especially two aspects of the history one is to look at how the the colonial impacted on the interethnic relations and the second aspect is on india sri lanka relations so it's an it's a challenging task because unlike india sri lanka had more than 400 years of uh, history and uh, involving three colonial masters you can see here portuguese followed by dutch and then the british but here there is a difference between uh, british and portuguese and dutch portuguese and dutch were mainly interested in the maritime domain of sri lanka but it was british who penetrated deep inside this gives us some kind of underpinnings of what is happening even today uh it was just santayana who said that those who fail to uh, learn from history are condemned to repeat it and you all know what marx said history repeats itself first as tragedy and then as a farce and then it was theodore roosevelt i think who said that the more you learn from history the better you are prepared for the future so with that particular context i think we need to understand the historical underpinnings here so british and the dutch as i said they were more interested in maritime and we can look at now what is happening here trincomalee hambantota colombo the whatever powers that are there uh, roaming around uh, around sri lanka is does that 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 history teaches something on this particular aspect and it was britishers who actually uh, entangle the country uh, deeper inside and uh, i'm going to look at only three aspects there are a lot of things that we could uh, look at but it was uh three aspects that uh, because of paucity of time that i'm going to look at the first is that it was britishers who firstly territorially unified the country earlier there were three kingdoms we all know that jaffna kingdom kandian and the low country it was they who firstly actually tried and unify into five provinces <coughs> in one administrative unit ruled by what was they called as government agents presently you have government agent called as district magistrate in india so it was in response to what happened in 1918 rebellion and then came the unification they also did what was known as the infrastructural linkages especially the roads and rails which they did in every uh, uh, every part of the empire in which it is said that sun never set and as a result what happened was there was lot of interaction among the communities because of the movement and this we need to take note of but this is very important where the colonization policy that they actually tried to uh, tried to actually uh, put in force this came in 
as a result of land development ordinance that was in 1930s where the justification was on the Sinhali side where now you are actually uh, allowed to go to your so-called heartland which was then represented by Polonaruva and Arun Anuradhapura kingdoms. After some point, Sri Lanka is known for a good irrigation systems. But after some time, these irrigation systems were withdrawn and those irrigation systems at one point, especially you can see there at uh, the cent north central, right? North central parts, they became dry and that actually divided between north the northern kingdom represented by Tamils and the southern uh, two kingdoms by Sinhalese. But now Britishers justified that you can uh, actually go to the heartland but to be fair to the Britishers, they wanted to actually modernize economically. That is where they started encouraging the, the colonization of the dry zone. But as a result what happened was there was a tussle between heartland and homeland. Sinhalese saw this as going to the heartland and settlement but Tamils there saw that as you are encroaching on our homeland. This is what the tussle and this tussle continued throughout the post-independence period. I'll come to it. And these were the famous projects that were actually taken forth by the independent, in, independent Sri Lankan governments. Now you can see here, this is how it was interpreted. On the one side you can see that how the, the so-called colonization was increasing in terms of numbers of the uh, Sinhalese settlements from wet zone to the dry zone and how this was actually seen on the right side, how Tamils saw this as. Now you can see some of the statements here, I would just quote here, how the federal party in way back in 1950s itself, even before independence they started raising this issue, why you are actually trying to colonize us. They interpreted this as calculated move by the, Sin by the Sri Lankan governments to so-called crush Tamil speaking on their national areas. And you can see the famous Vadugodai resolution of 1976, how one of the, the nine uh, the resolutions was one this on colonization where they were more concerned about the so-called encroachment on the Tamil homeland to manage the minority. This is very important. And the response from the government was the wars were on the land and their main motive behind the colonize, so-called colonization was to make sure that there was no separate state. And this is where LTT also took note of. This is very important because the colonization scheme also resulted in the armed component in the sense that LTT started attacking the settlers and the settlers were armed by the government and as a result there was also armed component to the entire colonization. So they were in this particular letter, they were appealing directly to the Sinhala people, not to the government, maybe because they were not uh, hopeful of the government, they appealed directly to the people saying that so-called colonization was not acceptable. So this is how it is. So with this context, I am just now moving to the second aspect of the colonial impact which was actually the identity aspect. So I'll just give you a backdrop of this. There are schools of, three schools of thought when it comes to identity. Primordialists is one who argue that your identity is inherent, it is born. Um, Ambassador uh, Rao was talking about the DNA. So they say that it, it's, it's born within you, whatever your identity is, your Sinhala, your Tamil, or whoever it be, it's born. But con constructive school argue that no, it may be primordial, but it is all constructed by so-called ethnic entrepreneurs for their self-interest. So this is where the Britishers, uh, the colonialists, colonial masters come in, how they actually constructed the identities, saying that you are A, you are B, you are X, you are Y, and you need to actually uh, try and live up to that particular identity, how it is carefully constructed for their own interest, and we can see that evidence even today. And there are institutionalists who argue that all identities are institutionalized through your senses or affirmative actions or, uh, or, or in whatever the governmental uh, institutions, they actually institutionalize the identity to actually entrench the identity and make that interest oriented. So this is how the, with that three schools of thought, I would like to actually put also things in context, the colonial impact through these ethnic stratifications. French was also known for their the maintaining colonies and British, we all know that. But there is a difference in how they actually looked at the, 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 the colonies or the, the natives. You can see how French managed 
the 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 ethnic varieties and how british managed there is a, a difference british has followed what was known as unranked stratification where they tried to mix up all the ethnicity ethnicities where you can see the matrix that i, I have given especially in the sri lankan case it is not just sinhala before britishers came or british before britishers uh, unified there were low country and kandian there were all difference and you can see the caste system division and even in sri lankan tamils they were not united actually this ltt tried to do that they wanted to break the caste structures and things like that but you can see how caste is so entrenched muslims are known for eradicating the caste are known for not having the caste system but still you can see the community there and that applies to plantation tamil also so the point here is how britishers tried to play into these divisions one over the other and that continued even today so with that context so you can see here how they played this divide and rule using this particular identities what they introduced was the communal representation i am not accusing the colonialists but i am just trying to put things in perspective how this impacted in the post colonial uh, uh, independent sri lanka so firstly they introduced what was known as colonial representation in the councils especially and then they also tried to introduce territorial representation because colonial the communal representation was actually opposed by the minorities and then the uh, another impact was in terms of the english education where we all know this i am also speaking in that particular language otherwise you wouldn't understand me i would not understand you and you can see as a result of this english education the dominance how the tamils took that education seriously how they excelled in their professional and the government services and at independence they were actually trying to dominate around 30% of the uh, government jobs or 40 to 50% of professional or even 60% of professionals so this was not actually uh, appreciated by the majority so this goes to the so subhasha movement in terms of the response of course subhasha subhasha movement had the, the 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 roots even much before the independence but you can see here how that later came as a manifestation in the form of sinhala only act so you can see here as i was telling how it was not just ethnicity but also caste class mix for instance um, during the colonial rule how certain class for instance elites across the ethnic groups they tried to gang up together against certain castes so this is very important that's what i was telling unranked uh, ethnic stratification system followed by the britishers and later on in 70s it resulted also in standardization policy because they wanted to actually sort out that particular uh, a dominance by a particular ethnic community and during the these three things are very important during the colonial rule how the buddhist revivalist movement was trying to uh, take its head up for various reasons how that has resulted in the form of the antagonisms between these two communities for instance buddhist versus christians and buddhist versus muslims here interestingly tamil sided with buddhists and later on of course they fell apart but end of the day what we need to understand is there is no permanent enemy or friend but permanent interest this came out very clearly and the third aspect in terms of the the interaction in terms of the impact was the introduction in terms of the economic aspect where we all know that how britishers introduce a new uh, we 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 got embroiled in this uh, even before the independence itself and we were so concerned about this particular plantation tamils how they were treated now as a result of this community moving in because the the central parts of the majority whatever people that then existing people were not interested in working in plantations so as a result britishers introduced indentured laborers but that resulted in what was known as the resentment in the 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 kandian peasants because to be fair to them they could not actually expand the villages because they were surrounded by the plantations and plantation tamils as as a result their employment opportunity was also denied so you can see this actually trying to manifest in the form of riots and all kinds of manifestations in the post independence period they also were afraid that whether this tamils would gang up with other tamils to actually encircle them this was this also was very much there and this also brought was what was known as 
the plantation tamils or indian tamils were only made for this particular labor and the birth of ceylon national congress and over a period of time slowly the 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 whatever in the form of uh, anti whatever they called as anti indian origin kind of people here or the 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 economic manifestation in terms of traders businessmen all those <coughs> things this resulted in what was known as immediately after independence immediately after independence it resulted in two particular acts that resulted in oatless and stateless that leaves i'll quickly go into in the given uh, 3 minutes uh ma'am was talking about what gandhi said gandhi also said not only pearl but gandhi also said that india is a uh, sri lanka is a daughter state of india so this is very important so there are two things here one is the strategic unity that uh the impact the colonial impact so the daughter <coughs> the then british empire which was called as which was which india called as the jewel in the crown of british empire as long as they wanted to hold india they needed sri lanka so that is what very important sri lanka didn't have a proper independence movement but once they left india they also had to leave sri lanka so this is so important so significant sri lanka was so significant to hold on india and the the elite thought that whether india would dominate them post independence period this is where the fear of domination is and that resulted in the defense agreement entangling themselves with uh, the the commonwealth and also they actually trying to uh, uh, talk about the neutrality and things like that and this this goes on even today whether india is okay with some extra regional powers or not even if we say with good intentions that this is seen in a not in a not seen in a actual positive light and the second aspect in terms of colonial impact as far as india sri lanka relations is concerned is this is my last slide in terms of how we responded of course uh, uh, ma'am was talking about how we responded to plantation uh, communities after they are uh, making stateless and voteless but we also try to intervene at later not i could not use the word intervene we also try to respond in terms of how other communities were actually try to treated and uh, most importantly tamil nadu factor but i would uh, recollect what gandhi said gandhi's advice to these communities they said that you have now gone there it is your state don't come to us it is your state you should make that you should own up you should be there that is your motherland this is what advice gandhi was uh, talking about but later on the things change the the dynamics were different and that is how it is so in short there were actually five uh, uh, impacts three in terms of interethnic factors and two in terms of india <coughs> sri lanka relations with that i end thank you so much uh, i now invite dr umakant mishra to speak on buddhist masters mantras and their circulation in the medieval maritime literals of the bay of bengal locating abhayagiri monastery of lanka and its connection yes. with odisha Uh, Dr Mishra is assistant professor department of history Ravenshaw University Katak Odisha Thank you ma'am respected chair distinguished panelist on the dais and of the dais and also distinguished uh, audiences um, no my paper is on abhayagiri mahavihara which is in anuradhapura and uh, the starting point uh, would be to take the cordial from ma'am uh, who said that how to the challenge lies in how to build a nationalist inclusive nationalist discourse uh, that celebrates diversity whether genetically all south asians are same or not uh, is a very controversial topic now with you know dna results saying that r2157a is actually steps one which is there also very recently a nature publication say that one of the places in roopkund in uttarakhand has also uh, hellenistic mediterranean strand in our dna but more importantly so far as cultural dna of sri lanka is concerned uh, the challenge again uh, you know after long year of ethnic struggles and all that entailed uh, the real challenge as is to understand how sri lanka's history also contained um, 
these multiple strands even though there are minor strands within buddhism itself there is strong presence of vajrayana tantric buddhism in abhayagiri vihara in opposition to the mahavihara and mahastupa of anuradhapura and if you look at this is if you look at these history i'll be talking about what we find the mantras and dharanis from the abhayagiri dharani houses and connect with orissa and the mantras and dharanis that we have found from the archaeological sites to build of a story with abhayagiri at the central fossae of my argument which was a seat of mahan and vajrayan buddhism in sri lanka which is an important strand in the cultural dna of sri lanka which was forged or genetically you might say culturally genetically engineered taken out by nationalist cultural engineering which constructed singhala dipa merely as a dhamma dipa of pure land theravada buddhism rather than you know incorporating all the diverse strands both of buddhism as well as other religions this idea of dhamma dipa supported by the traditional chronicles of mahavansa dipavansa and chulavansa represents this island as a land of pure theravada buddhism and when it was threatened by foreign invaders be it elara or pandians or cholas or kalingans or by mercenaries or by dissidents within buddhism within buddhism the central authority both religious as well as temporal which converged in anuradhapura came together to restore the prestige of rashtra that is nation daya the country and the religion and therefore in the traditional narrative as well as of chulavansa mahavansa and dipavansa as well as the buddhist nationalist narrative which came up with angiraka dharmapala but became more prominent with walpol rahula you know buddhism in sri lanka a narrative that only tried to project sri lanka as the land of dhamma dipa of pure land theravada buddhism uh, you know denying or suppressing the other strands of religions cultures and i am going to look at uh, the history of abhagiri uh, and see the presence of you know other strands in um, in abhagiri if you look at asala perahar annual religious festival that was instituted by king nayakara king kirti rajasinghe in 18th century if you look at the primary functions of this royally sponsored public rite it was to express in orderly and symbolic fashion the hierarchy of divine and social identity that constitutive of the kandian socio economic cosmos what is interesting about asala perihar festival is that this particular selections of incorporated hindu deities and mahayana buddhi sattva avalokiteshwara patnikar shiva and vishnu along with you know buddha in the top in the annual <coughs> festivals of kandian kingdom in the form of asala perihar that so that even in 18th century even though there was a hierarchy Uh, your diverse cities were recognized and celebrated uh, sorry if you look at this is a map taken from mahabansa about uh, anuradhapura if you look at um, abhagiri is in the north uh, it was started in, uh, it was founded by abhaya bhatagamini in 5th century bc buddhism went to sri lanka with mahinda who constructed also the mahathuppa thupparam and mahavihara no sri lanka narrative was concentrated on the sanctity of mahathuppa where also relics of buddha were there in the thupparam um, if it is working then i can see uh, yes uh, this area is the mahathuppa and maha um, bihara area and th- this was considered to be the most important because mahatuppa contains the collar bones uh, also thupparam contains the collar bone of buddha on the other hand abhagiri in 5th century bc when was constructed by uh, 
uh, Abhaya Bhattagamini emerged as an important center of other strands, even though it started as a Theravada Buddhist center, soon it became, um, became a, an important center of Mahayana and Vajrayana Buddhism. The Mahavansa describes that in the reign of Bharirika Tissa, 209 to 231 AD, monks adhering to Betula Bada, In the Bhurari Katissa, monks adhering to Bhetula Bada gained influence at Avahigiri Bihara. Many scholars believe that Bhetula Bada contains many doctrines of Mahayana, which led to struggle between Mahavihara monks and Avahigiri monks. The Mahavansa describes how 60 dissident monks expelled from Avahigiri fled to South India during the reign of Gothavaya 249-262 C. The Mahavansa states that with the accession of King Mahasena in the 3rd, 4th century AD, it saw the suppression of Theravada doctrine practiced by Mahavihara monks and Mahasena patronized Mahana doctrines of Avahagiri. After that, there followed a long struggle between monks of Mahavihara and that of Avahagiri adhering to Bethulabad. According to Chulavansa, he a purification ritual of Abhagiri Vihara took place in the reign of Silamega Vahana 609-628. However, notwithstanding the purification rituals to purge Mahana element from the monastery, Abhagiri had developed into an important international Mahana and Vajrayana center and in 792 AD, uh, an Abhayagiri monastery was actually constructed in Indonesia by Panarabhan Samaratunge in Ratuboko area of Indonesia. So it became so important a center of Vajrayana Buddhism. These long years of struggle finally ended with the purification ritual performed by Parakram Bahu, who is regarded as a national hero in 12th century AD. The Chulabhansa, the chronicle narrates that King Parakram Bahu purified the Mahavihara fast, that is, and then unified it with Abhagiri and Jetavana, two important Mahana centers. The monks of these two traditions were then defrocked and given the choice of either returning to the laity permanently or attempting to reordinations under Mahavihara. That means they were asked the Maha the the <coughs> Abhagiri and Jetavana monks were asked to be subordinate to Mahavihara and become and become part of the novices of the yes. Richard Gombridge writes that though the chronicle says that he reunited the Sangha, the expression glosses over the fact that he did was to abolish the Abhagiri and Jetavana Nikaya. He licensed many monks from Mahavihara Nikaya, all the monks in the other two, and then allowed better ones among the latter to become novices in the new unified Sangha. Therefore, all other strands of Buddhism uh, which gained prominence in Avahagiri Vihara was actually purged and the Vihara was, um, was purified. And I, then I will look into, uh, this is a map of Abhagiri and this is the stupa and we have also Avalokiteshwara Natha which is a Mahan tradition of, from Abhagiri. Then the, in the Tantric Buddhism phase we have from Abhagiri mantras which is called Dharanisa and it is to these Dharanis that I will be focusing on now. Uh, there is also a tantric, there are many tantric monks which went to, from um, India to Abhagiri like Bajra Buddhi, Amogu Bajra, who took many Bajrayana texts like Bajrayana <coughs> Tantra, Sarbat Thagat Tattva Sangra and we have the biography in China from 9th century who talks about what <coughs> these Bajrayana masters did in uh, Abhagiri to spread Bajrayana doctrines in Sri Lanka. And we have this now inscription from Ratuboka which speaks of how Abhagiri monks went to Indonesia in central Java and an Abhagiri monastery was constructed for the Silanese monks by uh, Samaratunge.
there are other monks as well uh, who went to Bajrayana monks who went to Abhagiri and practiced and uh, Tantra, Tantrayana Buddhism. Uh, but coming to what I, uh, what is interesting about Odisha and uh, Sri Lankan Abhagiri Dharanis are these are the formulas we have found from Dharani, from Abhagiri Dharani Ghara. And there are eight granite slabs. Uh, the fourth and fifth were uh, identified so by Sopena. And you know, this is a tra trans, uh, translation, uh, transliterations in Sanskrit. And it says that this Dharani has been identified as Arya Sarbat Thagata Adhishtana Hudaya Guiha. Uh, dhatu Karanda Mudra Nam Dharani Mahana Sutra and if, and if anybody uh, who deposits this Dharani in the stupa they will get the benefit of one lakh stupa. Exactly the same is to be found in Odisha in this Dharani which is now in Odisha State Museum it also says the same. Obviously you know establishing the connection between the masters like Amogo Vajra, Vajra Swati, Sat, uh, Vajra Buddhi and Subhakara Simha who took it to different parts of uh, India to Sri Lanka and then from Java to uh, China and then to Japan. Then there are another Dharani, you know, sixth and seventh, uh, which are taken from Sarvathagata Tattva Sangra and it and this is the Sanskrit dharani that we have in slab number seven. It invokes Lord Buddha Bhairochana along with various Pujapakaranas like Puspa, Gandha, uh, Deepa and exactly the same kind of iconographic programs of Bhairochana surrounded by Dhupa, Deepa, Gandha have been found from Udaigiri archaeological site establishing again the Vajrayana connection between Odisha and um, Abhaygiri. Also, Vajra uh, Buddhi Amago Vajra took Sarva Tathagata Tathasangra, a Vajrayana text to um, Sri Lanka Abhaygiri and we have also iconographic program of Mandala Stupa in Ratnagiri uh, based on Sarva Tathagata So the other aspects of Odisha Sri Lanka connections, um, we have the Dathavang, so which talks about the transfer of tooth relic from Odisha to Sri Lanka. We have also supporting evidence from Glass Palace Chronicle of Burma, written during the time of Anuartha. It also takes up how you know the tooth relic also went from Kalinga to Sri Lanka, therefore giving credence to 12th century Dathavansa tradition of tooth relic going from Kalinga to Sri Lanka. <coughs> we have many other connections including matrimonial alliance in the pre polonorubu period and Polonoru period, uh, some of them have been mentioned. Nisanka Malla who left for us Golapata stone book uh, containing 33 inscription on stone of 26 feet, 5 feet, 2 feet in Polonarabu. Nisankamalla's father and mother were from Kalinga he, <coughs> and his uh, mother was Parbati uh, who was from Ganga Vansa, that is Eastern Ganga, who constructed Jagannath temple. Uh, he created a Kalinga Pura, Kalinga Udyana, Kalinga Bana. His successor Sahasamallah's copper coin have been found from the excavations of Aravati port, establishing yeah. relationship between Odisha and Sri Lanka. Thank you. May I now invite uh, Sri N. Satyamurti, from, who is senior fellow and director of ORF Chennai, to speak on cultural linkages and contemporary contexts. Good morning, everybody. Last month, Sri Lanka Air Force conducted a seminar or a conference at Kata Nayake on the history of air power in Sri Lanka. One decision, see, unfortunately, this report did not appear in major Sri Lankan newspapers. One conclusion that they arrived at was 
Ravana was the, the oldest aviator in the world. But it ended with the rider, which amounted to saying that we do not believe in the Sita abduction story and the rest of it. Two, I think in April, two Sri Lanka scientists, professors working in an Australian university produced the first Sri Lankan, what they call the Sri Lanka satellite, which has one cubic meter, sorry, one uh, uh, cubic inch in dimension. That's what was published. Again, it was not. All the English newspapers carried it, one or two pairs, nothing more. It was launched by some, uh, from some pad in the U.S., along with the hundred or other more similar satellites. The name of that satellite was Ravana 1. And I read somewhere by one of the uh, scientists saying, why have you named it? Because we want future Ramana series satellite to keep an eye on India from the sky. <laughs> right? So to talk about cultural linkages between India and its own thing, India and Sri Lanka its own thing, putting it to a contemporary context is entirely different. No one in Sri Lanka or India will can't push in or challenge there are cultural linkages. In fact, Singhalas take pride in identifying the birth of Buddhism to India, Odisha in particular, Kaliga in particular. And today, like if Muslims across the world go, go to Mecca, Buddhists, particularly rural women, call, collect their pennies to make a visit to Bodh Gaya and all that. So that part of it is known <coughs> first thing. They also don't question that Pali came from there, Buddha came from there, Buddha visited Sri Lanka. Right? When you talk about upcountry Tamils, we all know they also went from uh, Sri Lanka. Sorry, the yeah, southern part of India. Of course, they also don't say that there was already caste system in the Japna Tamils and the Singhala communities. The upcountry Tamil took casteism from here and implanted it there. That's all to it. So even today, that casteism in all three communities, and as uh, Professor Manoran was hinting it, it is also there in a way in Islam, and Muslims in Sri Lanka. <coughs> Why I'm saying this is, we need to understand, contextualize India-Sri Lanka relations basically in contemporary context or say post-independence context without stopping with talking about linkages. Yes, I think the Indian uh, railways post-war in Sri Lanka started a program of taking Indian pilgrims, I mean Indian tourists to historical uh, uh, important sites of historical importance like Sita Elia, Rama Elia and things like that. I think it was a partial success. People anyway go to Sri Lanka for tourism and uh, buying textiles made there for Indian brands which are sold at a higher price. Beyond that, should we press this relationship to a factor that people start digging back into history and create more problems for us today than we need. Because there is a lot of contemporary culture, I mean, aspects to India-Sri Lanka relations, pre-war, post-war, scientific uh, cooperation, educational cooperation, development cooperation. Say, let us take China. That is also an issue that we keep discussing all the time. So my personal view is, much as there are cultural linkages, let us do it as an academic enterprise or as a personal enterprise to understand these things. Do not use as a diplomatic or a bilateral tool thinking that it is going to work. As we know, let us be honest in this hall. 
Sri Lankan Tamils never considered themselves as Indian Tamils until the first batch of refugees landed there. We are, I had interacted with them almost from day one because a lot of them were staying in my neighborhood. They had only contempt for Indian Tamils, Tamils of India. Your language is uh, polluted, your city is polluted, all those things. Now there is a greater appreciation of bilateral relations. And when in India they would say, uh, talk about the umbilical cord bondages, but if they are going to talk about umbilical cord bondages, they are not natives of Sri Lanka. So there they have to play another card. And they are doing it quite uh, efficiently. These are factors we have to take into consideration when we talk about contemporary Contextual, contemporary contextualization of bilateral relations. This does not mean it, there are no. In fact, I think uh, the professor talked about Abhayagiri and all that. In Anuradhapura, one of the stupas, there are five or seven stupas in the temple with the five, I forgot the name of the temp, uh, temple with five Buddhas. I could actually read it. I don't know Singhala. Then after coming to Colombo, suddenly I remember I could read it. How could I read it? Because it was in Malayalam. The gate who is a um, uh, retired employee of uh, Archaeological Survey uh, of Sri Lanka, Department of Archaeology of Sri Lanka, told me, explained it very well. Be in the Parakrama Bahu and all that I read. Because he said it was old Malayalam, old Sinhala, but I could read. <coughs> This doesn't mean that, uh, as many of us Indian believe, uh, uh, Singhala uh, alphabets went from Kerala. No, but Singhala, as we know, is the older, much much older language, written language. Mahavansa was is dated to five fifth century. Malayalam evolved as a language only five hundred to six hundred years back. Maybe that la language alphabets came here was used. That only proved there was greater interaction than we are ready to. So, but unfortunately, I told a, a lot of linguists in Chennai and uh, Colombo, why don't you people follow up? No one says, only one person said, sir, we need funding. Uh, I will approach UNESCO or something. Beyond that, nothing has happened as far as I know. Then, what do we, what is the takeaway? If we start talking about cultural engages beyond a point and dig deeper, we are going to come up with rival stories, contradicting versions. See, for instance, much as in South India we celebrate, or we as Indians and maritime experts in particular would call Raja Raja Chola a great navigator, a great uh, naval, for his naval expeditions, in Sri Lanka, he is held in utter contempt. One, among Singhalas, I don't mean Tamils. Two, most in people in Sri Lanka, they refer to India in contemporary context to Delhi and South India. By South India, I mean, they tam I mean Tamil Nadu because their history of Tamil Nadu, I mean South India, ended with the Chola Empire. Right? Two. This, there is a linkage. As uh, most of you know, 2000 years ago, that uh, battle between Ellara and Tutagamanu was, Tutagamanu won. My own reading after talking to some of the Sigala people, Tamil people, scholars on both sides, Sigalas never stopped Celebrating that victory. Tamil never stopped regretting that <laughs> defeat. A thousand years later, Rajaraja Chola goes there. Singhalas never stopped, uh, stopped defeat, uh, regretting that defeat. Tamils never stopped celebrating Rajaraja Chola's victory. Another thousand years later, we are talking about a 2000 year history. Prabhagaran comes to Madurai. Runs away from the securities in Sri Lanka, 
sits in a Madurai in a front house. We know who. That's a symbol for deity with a tiger. I don't know and people who had sat with him at that time. I asked them later. They said, I don't know whether it is. But in back in Sri Lanka, the Tamil saw it as a Chola emblem. So, return of the Raja Raja Chola. And the Singhalas also saw it the same way. So, if you are going to dig into history and sit down for a discussion, it will debate even between the two of us in a clash. These are parts of history we have come left beyond ourselves. And again, when, for instance, the days Prabhavaran passed, uh, died, what did a uh, singular newspaper say? They celebrated Mahindra Raja as uh, Dutta Gaminu too. Right? Some of them have not stopped celebrating it even today. So these are all factors we should not ignore when we start discussing about bilateral relations in the contemporary context. For instance, we talk about Hamad Nota Ambassador Rao was mentioning the background to an extent. Hamad Nota project was not a creation of uh, the, that government. Hamad Nota project, if you go back in history, almost from 1960s, every government in Sri Lanka has wanted to develop it. In fact, the first person to start it was CBK. Right? And it is there. China is not to go, uh, go away. If you, uh, if Mahindra Rajapaksa invaded China there, Daniel uh, Rajapaksa uh, Singh handed over that part to China for uh, 96 years. Ultimately, it took out to 106 years. It is a reality we have to work with. Likewise, Colombo City Project. And uh, in fact, uh, Ranil Vikramasinghe, for instance, he publicly declared we have to give this swap deal with China because we are a, a indebted nation, debt based a security. Hamad Dota was handed over. Two months later, the same government borrows another hundred billion dollars from the same China and to do what? Lay roads. I, okay, you can call it expressways or whatever. And we also need to remember that much as India, Sri Lanka relations is long, India, China, Sri Lanka, China relationship is not short. Right? They have history and dynamics of their own. And some of the diplomat veterans here would recall. In the, when we were constrained by circumstances not to help them militarily and as a policy of government of India, there were a few other things that happened. China supplied, when CBK wanted to take back uh, Jaffna from the LTTE in the mid-90s, after uh, efforts to strike a peace uh, deal with, uh, Prabhakaran happened. China supplied them the fighters they wanted. That is okay. We may have been kept informed about the uh, shopping list, etc., etc. But, when the Sri Lankan delegation went to discuss prices, the Sri Lankan delegation leader called the Sri Lankan, uh, sorry, the Chinese delegation leader called the Sri Lankan minister who are leading the team and told him, we know you don't have money. We are discussing the prices. Go back, we will get back to you whenever you are ready to pay. Two, in the, towards the end of the war, again, Sri Lanka wanted IMBL. Gota met Usharaf in Singapore in the presence of Gota Rajapaksa. Uh, uh, Musharraf called his uh, ordnance chief and dispatch. And that landed in Sri Lanka in five days. So their so-called indebtedness, morally right or uh, diplomatically correct for India relations, does not matter here. We have to learn to put those things also in the past. Take the day as it comes. And as Ambassador Rao started, it is a policy is never constant. 
as Sri Lanka is going to have a presidential election now. Winner or loser, we have to learn to work with them. And we better learn to work with the leader that Sri Lanka select. It could be even me if I were a Sri Lanka. This is any of us. Right? Who thought in India Deva Gowda would become Prime Minister? Who thought in Sri Lanka before November 2014, Sri Lanka will be the candidate? Though I had the information about one and a half years earlier. Mahindra Rajapaksa, I knew until the name was announced, he did not believe that Sri Lanka will be the candidate. He told me uh, about that one and a half years earlier, in summer of 2013, when I told him, Sir, the, do you know? No, 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 no. The, I know Ranil won't contest against me, but Sirisena, he will know. He will not stab me in the back. Right? These are situations peculiar to every country, India included. So let us not dwell deep into all the meaning, but for students who are sitting in, students of Sri Lanka sitting in the back seats or any other country, particularly in the neighborhood, learn that country. And particularly, I was told recently by some academic that there is a new international thought in international policy studies coming up as critical international relations, which is a bottom-up approach, what the people want, what the people need. That means you have to go back to history to understand the dynamics of the history and cultural linkages, cultural background, but contextually to the present situation. Thank you. My thanks to each and every one of our distinguished speakers for giving us a fascinating account of the numerous linkages that exist between India and Sri Lanka. Um, Niranjan Jaina spoke about language, literature, and art, and how literature becomes a reflection of the culture and society. So much of what we share between India and Sri Lanka, the influence of language, Sanskrit, Pali, Prakrit, religious ideas and thoughts, similar lifestyles, very important and uh, the values of discipline, conservation, peace, harmony, and nonviolence that shines through much of the discourse that he referred to, the language, the literature, and art, and how cultural cooperation, in this he contradicts what Mr. Satimurthy has just said, as being very important as an aspect of the bilateral relationship. You raised a very important point about cultural documentation and archives. And that's a subject of, about which I'm very obsessed. Uh, and I think both governments need to look more closely at the issue of uh, the opening of archives, more transparency, yes. more accessibility for scholars. Because unless you have that depth of scholarship, I think understanding gets compromised. And relations are impacted by it. Um, I'm reminded also uh, of uh, one of the most beautiful objects to my mind, in the British Museum in London. Whenever I go there, I just go and stand at the feet of the Tara from Anuradhapura, which was gifted by the Governor General, the then Governor General of Ceylon, Robert Brownrigg, uh, to the British Museum. I think it's one of the most beautiful uh, examples of Indo-Sri Lankan symbiosis, as I referred to it but with a very, very Sri Lankan identity. I think it's one of the most beautiful art objects. Uh, I think it completely outshines the Mona Lisa or any other paintings or works of art. Dr. Manoharan, the uh, concept of heartland and homeland, I think, was very, very apposite and relevant. <coughs> the concentration on the Sinhalese side with the heartland, I think it comes in in much of the Indian discourse today also. What are heartlands and how do you define them? And what are, how are people's memories and emotions and attitudes intertwined with the concept of heartland? And the issue of homeland, very, very central to the discourse of identity and uh, the definition of such identity and how the Sinhalese and Tamil approaches to both these concepts have in many ways molded the history, uh, current history of Sri Lanka today. Uh, colonization, not just 
in the British or the empire definition of the word, but also, again, in current history, post-independence history. Mm. How does colonization impact um, the passage, the rights of passage of a nation? And in Sri Lanka, I think it's, mm. it's a very important concept uh, to study. The entrenchment of caste, uh, the caste, ethnicity, and class mix, I think is something worthy of uh, discussion. Um, Dr. Umakant Mishra uh, on Vajrayana, Tantric strands at Abhaygiri. And uh, I'm reminded here, you know, much of Anuradhapura, Polanarwa, uh, and places like that were, you know, really taken over by the Vanni, by the jungle, up until the mid 19th <coughs> century. And then you have the rise of um, uh, scholars like Anagarika Dharmapala, uh, you, you, you see him at the Parliament of Religions in Chicago in 1896. Along with, huh? Along with Swami Vivekananda. Yeah, exactly. He was part of the group that accompanied Swami Vivekananda to Chicago. And the whole revival of Theravada Buddhism in Sri Lanka uh, with very strong linkages to Burma, Myanmar and Thailand. So a revival that includes Southeast Asia and the Bay of Bengal <coughs> community, I think, is a fascinating aspect. And uh, coming to Mr. Satyamurti, uh, the issue of Ravana in Sri Lanka, I think, is the subject um, which merits a separate study. Uh, of course, uh, we uh, know from uh, Hindu belief <coughs> and our own mythology uh, that Ravana uh, was not just the villain of the Ramayana, but also a scholar and uh, a great Saivite, and all of us who have gone to Kailash Mansarovar have seen Rakastal or Rakshastal, where it is said Ravana meditated for, for many, many years uh, in worship of uh, Lord Shiva. So we have a satellite called Ravana watching over all of us, as you say. <laughs> Quite a contradiction in terms, I must say. And uh, so uh, you mentioned this issue of cultural linkages. We don't use it as a bilateral diplomatic tool that you have to adjust to reality as it evolves. And uh, you need to have a pragmatic, uh, hard-nosed approach to many of these issues. I, I, I agree with you. But wouldn't you think that cultural diplomacy as an aspect of relations between two countries can become a vehicle to promote deeper understanding and empathy uh, between peoples, provided it is approached in, in the right manner, not politicized and not uh, <coughs> laid over with subjective associations, which then begin to color people's opinions yeah. and uh, create sense of prejudice or alienation or separation. Question to you. Thank you. Yes, that is also what I meant. Let us keep this culture, linkage, uh, tourism and all that on known track and do not, yes, the same Indian High Commission there and the Sri Lankan High Commission here are going to coordinate all those things in a bigger way. But let us not, should we tame it as uh, cultural diplomacy or cultural exchanges and uh, etc, etc. For a simple reason, somewhere along the line, there is an overlapping of these ideas. A lot of tourists, in fact, uh, I think Indians are the single largest tourist population to Sri Lanka these days post-war. <laughs> and Sri Lanka, I think nearly 100 flights a day to a week to various parts of India, you don't get tickets. So those exchanges are happening at individual levels. As I said, by train and uh, you can uh, revive the boat mail from Chennai to uh, Colombo, all those things are now possible post-war. Particularly now that there is some kind of a solution being worked out to the fisheries issue by the center and the state government in Tamil Nadu. These are all possible. Should, but these cultural exchanges, how do we make it meaningful as people-to-people -people contact? That is not actually happening because tourists, I go to Sri Lanka in my own capacity, meet a hundred people and come back. But when we go there, both governments should work. How people get to meet more people from the other side. People land in Katanayake, 
a tourist operator from Colombo would be waiting. They go around the, the thing, stay in hotels. They are to, so tired for a one week package, they would end up in three days, come back. That is also happening the reverse. Maybe from the Sikala side, when they come to Bodhgaya and all that, they travel by train. Unfortunately, the absence of common language, they are also confined to themselves. We have to work very seriously. For instance, in the last 20 years, if you have noticed, students, now a lot of students from Sri Lanka study here, thanks to the MBA scholarships, or from there, I, at one stage I heard that in Baroda there were 1,000 Sri Lankan students. Why can't we do it as a daughter aspect where people come here? See, for instance, if you take uh, military person from each other country, go and train elsewhere. Generally, they don't mix with the local population. How to make that a real people-to-people -people movement? Uh, but uh, I agree with you, but I think this permeation of Indian culture into Sri Lanka, popular culture, you know, we all see Colombo 3 and Colombo 7, as those districts of Colombo are called, where there's a lot of westernization, people love western music, and they will talk of Beethoven and Tchaikovsky, but you go a little beyond that, you go to Dehiwala, you go to Velavata, you go to these suburbs of uh, Colombo, and you see uh, popular culture from India staring back at you. And we did a concert at the uh, Indian Cultural <coughs> Center in Colombo <coughs> two months ago. And uh, it was featuring the music of Talat Mahmood, Hindustani uh, Bollywood, so called, I call it Filmistan, I don't call it Bollywood, <laughs> Filmistan songs uh, from the 50s and 60s. And so many Sri Lankans, mainly Sinhalese in the audience, would come up and t tell you how many of these popular songs sung by Lata and Talat and Hemant and Mohammad Rafi had been transcribed in, with Sinhalese words. So every song, popular song which you hum, uh, was sung in Sinhalese by some of your famous singers. <coughs> so that's the extent of influence that popular Indian culture has uh, on, on Sri Lanka to this day, but beginning from the post-independence uh, era uh, of the country. Yes, Hindi films definitely have a and large audience on Sri Lanka TV, and Hindi film songs are used for their dance competitions in TV, like their Tamil films, of course, in Tamil TV channels. So I, I'd like to open we up… We have to take it forward. Open up. Uh, how much time do we have for uh, for Already questions and answers? Maybe, Maybe just ten minutes. I will put. Minutes. We'll yeah. keep two or three questions together. Uh, please do identify yourself while asking your question and ask a question. Uh, please don't go into any lengthy uh, exposition of what you think. Please. Yeah. Please take the mic so that uh, we can. Uh, record everything properly. Okay, I'm uh, General Chopra. I'm a combat veteran of four wars, including the fourth and the commander sitting over here. I want to focus, ma'am, your opening address, the contemporary dimension. You brought out that Raja Paksha, when he came in, there was a phenomenal change in Sri Lanka. Now, we are seeing the beginnings of another Raja Paksha coming in. I think in our, <coughs> in our analysis and so on, we must factor this into account and not be concerned about earlier park and Chinese dimension, but what's going to happen? That's my, I'd like your comments on that. Number two, you spoke of Buddhism, and there are a lot of people, a lot of speakers who talk about religion and culture. Buddhism, as I see it, in Sri Lanka is not only assertive, it's becoming aggressive. This is also happening in Myanmar, not happening in the rest of the Buddhist world. Maybe you can throw a light. Just two very quick observations. One. When I was with the IPKF in Sri Lanka and there was a slant over drinks <coughs> against India, your point, ma'am, about we being the only neighbor, I should tell them every morning look up. And if you don't like what's happening up and the Tamil sit down, Sri Lanka is going to sink. And finally, let's not harp too much on Hanban Tota. Let's look at Trincomalee. That's the pearl in the day. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, one more question, <coughs> please. I am S.K. Mathur, former ambassador to Norway, Yugoslavia, etc. My question is uh, to Dr. Manohar and also to you. After the, defeat of, mic, please, sir. after the defeat of LTT, 
would you say that the distrust and animosity between the Sinhalese and Tamils have, doubt, have died down? <coughs> Both Thank you. Uh, one more question. That lady there. We'll take from, yeah, there are two ladies. Yeah. One of you. One of you, uh, yes. Identify yourself. Uh, I'm Gulwin. I'm Gulwin Sultana from IDSA. Louder. Uh, I'm Gulwin Sultana from IDSA, and ma'am, my question is to you. Uh, ma'am, you uh, talked about Hammond Tota port because we saw it from uh, Economic Prism, and that's why we didn't uh, accept the offer. Uh, my question is. Not uh, me, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's on the Sampur coal power plant. Uh, finally, it got scrapped, it's been cancelled now. But when we accepted in 2009, that time I understand there was problem because that Sampur area people were displaced and Tamils were against it. Then, uh, even then, <coughs> why did we accept that project that time? Thank you. So, uh, one more, the last we take. Thank you so much, ma'am. I'm Dr. Stuti Banerjee. I'm a research fellow at the council, and my question is to Dr. Manmohan. You spoke about there being two kingdoms, essentially the Sinhala identity and the Tamil identity, which was there. I just wanted to know, uh, step, uh, taking from the question that was posed to you before, uh, is there that that fault line which continues today? Was there? it was there, I mean, I'm going from the history that we have of princely states and how they were integrated into India at the time of independence. And I, I don't study Sri Lanka that much, so I'm not very familiar with its history. I just wanted to know from you, mm -hmm. as the kingdoms came together under the British rule and thereafter independence, did those fault lines continue into the problems that followed? And where do you see them uh, in the future as Sri Lanka comes together once again? Thank you. So shall we, uh, yes, uh, so uh, from the general, uh, about Gotabaya Rajapaksa, uh, of course we don't know what the outcome of the presidential election will be. Uh, people are also on the UNP side, I notice, uh, rooting a lot for Sajid Premadasa, uh, but of course within the UNP they'll have to sort things out first before, before. But I notice very interestingly that he speaks about devolution, about the need for devolution. I don't know whether it's an <laughs> electoral platform or political speech that he's giving or whether this will translate into uh, actual changes on the ground. But I agree with you. Uh, too much of a focus or obsession with what has happened and, uh, and uh, creating our own specters of the imagination out of what you know, how this is going to impact us in the future doesn't make for good policy. And I think uh, we have to uh, factor in the changes and uh, what does this, what does this <coughs> mean? I mean, the, the re-emergence of the Rajapaksas, for instance, what does it mean? The people want it, the people want strong, centralized, uh, you know, uh, sort of, uh, what shall I say, this kind of a, a, more, a kind of paternalistic, to put it, perhaps diplomatically, one could say, uh, much more concentration of power at the center. Things get done. Many people want things to get done, action on the ground. I think it happens here also. <coughs> How much can the government deliver? And uh, the Rajapaksas have a record on deliverance uh, as far as changes within the country, infrastructure, development, improvement of Colombo City, all that you can see on the ground. Uh, and the, the record of the last five years or four years is compared with that. So we'll have to see how that impacts the outcome of the election. But we must be prepared uh, to, for policy adjustments to take into account these realities, which are the choices of the people of Sri Lanka. Uh, we can't impose uh, these choices on them. And I think uh, in this, in Singapore, in Sri Lanka, I see a lot of writing that is coming out which, which says, can Sri Lanka be the next Singapore? But how can you be the next Singapore unless you deal uh, with the political infighting and uh, you get over, uh, you know, the uh, the <coughs> questions that are raised about the uh, final days of the civil war, the international pressure that is going to continue on Sri Lanka, I assume, uh, if certain election outcomes uh, are before us. So, uh, so we have to get, I think we, ha you know, we have to be prepared and to, to see policy as not as static, but constantly uh, adjusting within an organic whole. Where does Sri Lanka stand 
in the, in the uh, calculation of our interests as a country, strategically, security-wise, economically, people-to-people uh, -people linkages. Uh, and how we don't have to copy China on this, but how we can offer a different set of, <coughs> of convincing options to Sri Lanka. <coughs> I think Trincomalee, I completely agree with you. I've always felt uh, Trincomalee is something we should, we should develop uh, a policy on Trincomalee uh, rather than be obsessed uh, with Hampantoto. Of course, subject to Sri Lanka as the sovereign power uh, being willing to accommodate those interests. Because you saw the way the Ceylon Petroleum, Petroleum Corporation workers went on a strike when there was news that uh, Mr. Vikramasinghe was going to, Shri, uh, to India to sign a deal on Trincomalee and certain promises were extracted from him before he left that he would not sign. So even Sri Lanka, this quotient of trust regarding India, I think that is a factor that is stuck in the throat literally uh, for both countries and particularly in Sri Lanka. Ambassador Mathur about uh, distrust and animosity having, uh, whether it has died down between the Tamils and the Sinhalese, you have to ask the Sri Lankans about that. I think these, uh, these that's where history comes in. That's where, you know, uh, attitudes built over the centuries. Uh, the whole question of Buddhism as the majority <coughs> religion. Uh, where does majoritarianism come in and where do minority rights come in? And does the minority feel sufficiently assuaged that justice is being done to them? Uh, I think the, the last word has not been said on it as yet. And as I said, the battle for the hearts and minds of the Tamils may not have been won as yet. And um, Sampur, uh, you asked about why Sampur. Uh, Sampur is near Trincomalee. Again, it would have been <coughs> excellent if we had done something there, if we had done a developmental project in Sampur. Environmental concerns were raised about a coal-fired plant. The last I heard was that it's been now decided to set up a solar energy uh, project uh, in Sampur. So I hope that goes forward. But then the whole larger issue of Trincomalee, I'm always reminded of how one of the earliest ships that Parsi shipbuilders built in the old Bombay, we were great shipbuilders in those days, which was the HMS Trincomalee, which you can still see in England somewhere, okay. I think. The mic, please. Yes, the High Commissioner, High Commissioner Austin Fernando, who I count as one of my oldest <laughs> friends in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. <laughs> about Sampur, I don't want to be talking about this uh, many political issues. It's not fair for me to do that. But Sampur is a factually situation is a little different. Sampur, the what happened was this village, that area was used by the LTT to potentially attack the uh, general Calcutta knows what it uh, potentially attack the attack the Trinko port uh, where the navy was there so they had to take these people away as a military strategy action so then now what happened is it was uh, kept under navy control and I'm, I was the man who cleared that therefore I can speak with authority when I the governor of uh, eastern province I uh, got the military, the navy to get out of that place, but I gave them a separate place for them to uh, go and uh, have their new camp for training purposes. And the whole village was, the, all the villagers were brought back. Uh, they were living in huts in very poor conditions. All of them now have electricity, water on tap, houses, wells. They have their own shops. They have own, their own uh, cement block making factories. I like that and cultivation is being done. So the situation is that. So therefore, the problem of Sampur as a military uh, issue is cleared now. So much so, there was one case where a child had fallen into a well and died, and one of the troubled shooters, you see, in every society you have them, they want to say that the Navy has gone and killed this fellow. And it was the villagers who came back and said, no, it was not done. The child has fallen. So they have become so friendly and all that. So that's it. About the uh, about the uh, coal power plant, uh, it was by uh, the, some uh, political group uh, in in uh, in uh, Trincomalee. They started complaining about the uh, environmental degradation that could take place on this matter. So therefore, that had to be given up. But as uh, Ambassador Nirupamuru said, there is 50 megawatt uh, 
50 megawatt solar uh, solar uh, panel the solar energy production uh, matter is through it is to be started but anyway that have been now agreed upon the both countries so therefore that is not an issue as much as uh, thank you uh, if there is nothing more no more questions shall we any other comments yes. okay this Yes. Oh, yes. Two you have a question. Two I'm questions. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Two questions were asked. The both were pertinent questions. First, on ambassador's distress died down. Of course, uh, Ambassador Rao uh, answered it. But I put it in different manner. Suppose if uh, the the answer to the question lies, what is happening there? This is how I see. Suppose if there is no distress, reconciliation should be smoothly flowing. Suppose if there is no distress, the peace. I I mean here absolute peace should have returned. What happened in April? What happened to reconciliation? These are shows that the distress continues. To put it in in, in simple terms, what I could say is that the armed component of ethnic conflict was over in May 2009, but ethnic conflict continues. This is what I say. State building would have been over, but nation building continues. To cut it short, on the on uh, Dr. Studi Banerjee's uh, point about the fault lines. When colonialists came, they saw they, they saw a lot of fault lines in terms of the region, in terms of ethnicity, language, uh, religion, and even caste. A lot of fault lines were there, and they manipulated the fault lines, and that's why they found to rule over using those fault lines. It was so easy. Okay. But the point was the post-independence leadership. How did they actually address and manage these fault lines? Some policies, they wanted to continue the same colonial divided emperor kind of policy so that they thought that this was the best way to rule about. So this was the very unfortunate thing. Okay. That is where the basic law, I mean the constitution difference between Indian constitution and Sri Lankan constitution. So this is where we, they made up a mistake in terms of how they managed the fault lines. Had they managed the fault lines really well and uh, uh, tried to erase all the fault lines, I, I, I don't think Sri Lanka would have witnessed any kinds of conflict anywhere. You are looking at a very uh, composite culture here, perhaps we need to acknowledge that yes. both in Sri Lanka that your culture is composite, that Sinhalese don't come from one part of India and Tamils from the other part. You really, like in India, we are all uh, a product of an amalgamation of so many influences and I, once that realization drawns, I think reconciliation will be much better to achieve and we haven't yet uh, you know, people have not yet uh, realized that. That moment of nirvana has to come. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, and the speaker for sharing your thoughts on the important theme. Uh, we will begin with the second session now. The second session will be chaired by Ambassador Ronan Singh, and uh, the theme of the session is the shadow.